So the first question, what are the major challenges facing the Indian education system? How different or how similar are they to education systems, the challenges facing education systems in other countries around the world? Well, um, the Indian system historically comes from similar sources as uh, the education systems in, for example, Britain, Canada, Australia, and uh, to some extent, uh, the United States. Uh, it all dates back to, I guess, about the 18th century, the late 18th century. And, uh, and also, you have the whole of Latin America, um, large parts of Europe, which would have uh, taken the system out of the, 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 Spanish, uh, uh, the Spanish empires, uh, the Teutonic uh, Prussian empires, and so on. It was all empire-driven, basically. Um, and empire-driven in two kinds of senses. Empire-driven in the home country, from where the empires actually started, and empire-driven in the colonized country. And the, the, the objectives of the system were slightly different in, in both of those. So to that extent, we do have common problems. But in the subsequent 200 years, uh, some countries have made big changes and some haven't. So India, unfortunately, falls into the second category. It hasn't actually moved uh, quickly enough. Not that it hasn't moved at all, it has, but uh, not quickly enough. It's a sort of, uh, you know, too little, too late kind of, uh, kind of change. So the main problems uh, facing such systems anywhere, and particularly in India, is that the, the product, the end product, uh, is for another time, and uh, therefore doesn't actually fit our time. Uh, is there, now people might say that, what evidence do I have to say that, or on what basis would I say that? Well, I have two, two things to say. One is that in India, uh, there is a very wide, uh, widely prevalent system of private tuition. Uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, the parent feels that what the child learns in school uh, can be bettered by someone else, presumably using some other method or one is to one instruction or personalized instruction, whatever. So, that's one bit of proof and I think uh, private tuition is probably among the highest in the world in India. Uh, the second proof would be that there are entrance examinations to our big uh, engineering and medical schools, um, uh, sort of similar to uh, the ones they have in the UK and the USA, for which there are schools which prepare children after their formal schooling is over uh, to actually uh, sit for these exams, which obviously means that the school isn't preparing the student to answer those uh, exams. Uh, now, these engineering colleges uh, do move with the times because they have to, you know. They, so, that kind of to my mind shows that the school isn't moving quickly enough with the time. The colleges and the employers are just to survive and you have this whole block of private operators who fill up the middle, trying to, you know, basically do uh, what in engineering terms we would call repair and maintenance. So the question I'd like to ask is, what do learners need to know in the early 21st century? How should they get to know these things? And how should their learning be assessed? Okay, uh, one way to, to answer this question, if there is one answer, which I believe there isn't, would be perhaps to look at what do we need to do to be able to answer that question. <laughs> okay. So I take it one level back to say, what should the 21st century learner know? Um, I don't think we are in a position to make a list, but perhaps we can think about how to make such a list. And uh, making a list like that uh, involves, unlike in the past, it involves 
prediction. Um, I, I need to expand on that. It, in the past, at best, you would do projection. So you might say a, a car moves at 20 miles an hour now, when by the time my child grows up, it will move at 60 miles an hour. Uh, you can't do that anymore. So you can't pro you, you can't do linear projection. So you have to do predict, and prediction is risky business. Uh, there are some experts who predict things. So 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 instead of our trying to guess, I think one of the things that uh, a school principal or a curriculum maker should do uh, quite frequently is to look at what these experts are predicting. And and this might sound funny, it's a century where the rate of change is quick enough for us to use fantasy as a way, as a way to, to look at the future. So uh, I, I think I would allow both. So you look at predictions and you look at fantasy. And there's enough of both around anyway. Um, if you look at the recent past, movies that use fantasy uh, even five or six years ago, uh, actually predicted things that are pretty much routine right now. So uh, it's kind of funny to think that a school teacher should have seen that movie and said, this is going to happen. So I'm going to start you know, directing my teaching towards that. So, uh, so I think what, what the learner of the 21st century needs to know is how to, how to predict and how to fantasize or imagine uh, the future. Uh, what are those methods? And if there was a way for a school to uh, teach that, that would be extremely useful for the learner. Very interesting. Uh, and then you spoke about uh, how to assess. Yes. And there we are in really murky water because mm. um, the present assessment system is actually at the heart of the problem of, uh, that we have in education kind of drives education into the past because of the examination system. So if we need to uh, change that, if we need to change assessment, in what direction should we go? And I think that we should, we should look at methods where assessment becomes, in a way, non-invasive. Okay, if you can imagine an examination that takes place without the person being examined, even perhaps being aware of the fact that it's happening. Mm. Okay, somewhat like the change that has happened in medicine, where instead of filling up a long questionnaire of symptoms, uh, you have devices that do that for you and, and tell you very quickly. So, are we ready for that sort of thing in education and in psychology? Well, if not, I think we will be within the next decade. So, uh, I think the nature of the examination or the assessment will have to change to something else. What activities currently practiced in educational institutions around the world in 2016 do you think will become completely obsolete within the next 10 years? Well, um, it again requires some amount of guesswork and this time around uh, uh, at some risk to myself, <laughs> but uh, I would guess, and, and I emphasize the I because uh, these are not, you know, established uh, data-driven conclusions. I would guess uh, writing by hand um, would disappear completely. Um, reading as a skill, uh, now I, I need to explain that. That it, it sounds terrible if I say that you know reading will disappear, but reading as we understand it, which is mm -hmm. the ability to look at squiggly things on paper and convert them into words. Now that's an activity that machines can increasingly do as quickly and as well, and perhaps better than we can. Mm -hmm. So if those machines become integral to us, like the tablet phone, then maybe you still might be able to read, let's say, Japanese, but you would do so as a hobby rather than as uh, something that you absolutely must do. And the same for writing by hand. Calligraphy is already a hobby. Uh, you do it if you like to. 
um, writing, as I said, writing by hand, okay, that's a process, that's a skill, which will be increasingly less and less useful. But writing as a method for expressing a thought, that too will be under threat because it's no longer the only way to easily express a thought. Uh, for instance, video is you know, incredibly cheap and easy, um, uh, audio, um, any kind of media really is, uh, is now the domain of the individual, each individual. So that being the case, you don't need to say that it is only writing which I can carry around with me because I can carry a pen with me. But you have every way of expressing available to you. So the relative importance of writing goes down. And thirdly, the most controversial of the lot, uh, I think the kind of arithmetic we teach is actually process and not really um, about numbers. It's about a process to do with numbers. So how to multiply a three-digit number by a two-digit number on a piece of paper? An utterly useless skill. But there are many, many teachers who still believe that it's very beautiful. Uh, well, beautiful or not, if it's not useful, then it should go out of school, I think. So, so then we're left in a very peculiar situation of saying reading, writing, and arithmetic will all get undervalued. What will, you, what will we replace it by? My feeling is, again a guess, reading will get subsumed into a bigger subject called comprehension. Writing will get subsumed into a bigger uh, idea uh, which we might call communication. And arithmetic will get subsumed into a, a, a bigger idea which is computation. So whether you can comprehend, whether you can communicate, and whether you can compute, uh, regardless of whether you use traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic, is what the learner will need to know. That's a, that's a nugget of gold, that answer. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, on to te teachers and teacher education now. So my next question, what should teacher education colleges be focusing on if they are to adequately prepare educators for 21st century learners? Well, teacher education, I think young people who are, uh, you know, getting trained to become teachers, uh, the first thing that we need to do is to explain to them or, or, or actually, I shouldn't say explain to them, but have them discover what is wrong with the existing system? Uh, if they are not convinced, then the, the effort goes waste in, in trying to tell them to do things differently. So they must discover it for themselves. So I would say that the first bit of the first year would be an exploration by the teachers, uh, basically undermining or, or finding out the weak points of the old 18th century education that we have. And, uh, and, and agreeing that it needs to go. The second bit would then be of what should it be replaced by. And once again, in the 21st century, given the kind of access to information we have, I don't think there will be a master teacher standing somewhere and telling them. Instead, they will find out for themselves. And each person will develop their own styles of how they will deal with what I just described as comprehension, communication, and computing. Um, so I see the teacher training program as a year-long research and discussion amongst young people, and perhaps a second year or half a year of practicing that, first among themselves and then with actual schools. All right, last question, a little bit of fun involved with this question. Um, you have just been anointed as a benevolent dictator and you have the power to change the way we deliver 
early years and primary education around the world. Could you just describe the key elements of your manifesto? Um, actually, that's pretty easy because it, it will probably be just a one-liner ma manifesto. Uh, well, not, not exactly, but uh, I think I would... Okay, let, let's take pedagogy, uh, curriculum and assessment. Um, actually, the order in which it happens is that you, you have curriculum, then you have pedagogy, then you have assessment. So if I take those, then the manifesto would be firstly for curriculum to ask the question, what are the, the big things that we don't know and therefore cannot teach, as opposed to the existing uh, paradigm, which is what are all the big things we know which can be taught and therefore our children should know those things. So you turn that over to say, what are the big unknowns? In any case, the big unknowns are going to lead you to the big knowns because that's how humankind progresses. But it becomes a much smaller curriculum because the key questions are, you know, few and they've been around for as long as we've been around on this planet. So then comes pedagogy. If the child is steeped in the internet, then uh, pedagogy for all practical purposes just vanishes really. My only caution would be don't leave your child alone with the internet. Have his groups, have his friends together and let them, let them go and do it for themselves. Uh, a one-liner would be move back from the agricultural method to the hunter-gatherer. You know, uh, uh, that would be for pedagogy. And the third bit is assessment. Well, assessment, I'm not very clear what we should do, but I think we can roll together curriculum, pedagogy and assessment into one single thing. So, so the so-called exam actually teaches. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that. We, we know that once you give an exam, then you remember those answers quite well for a very long time because you were under such stress. <laughs> but uh, what will such a question look like? So I'll just finish off with that. But, uh, you know, the benevolent dictator bit, I might say that a, a school... Um, a middle school examination might be that you have 5,000 rupees and a slightly arthritic grandmother. What's the best holiday you can buy her for those 5,000? Use the internet. So, given to an eight-year-old, uh, it will involve researching what arthritis means what do old people's holidays look like anyway? Uh, how far can you go with 5,000? Does the internet cheat you? <laughs> In what ways does it cheat you? Uh, would it be better to, to take surface transport or fly? Uh, how about medical attention? If they're working on this in groups, there's a huge swath of curriculum that gets covered mm -hmm. at one shot. How would I assess? I would just watch or a teacher one of the senior teachers just watches this whole thing and at the end of it she has to produce a a gut reaction and perhaps we'll give her only two choices she could either say that was awful or she could say jolly good <laughs> and that's it classic thank you so much Sigala. thank you <laughs> it was marvelous thank you Thank you.